Welcome to Love in the Love Boat, where we break down episodes of one of the greatest romantic comedy drama television series of all time. I'm Ishvan, Chicagoland's beloved children's musician and TV fanatic. And I'm Michelle, pop culture enthusiast. So come aboard. We're expecting you to join us for another edition of Love in the Love Boat. Michelle. Ishvan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm known by many names. Yeah. Thank you for using my performance name. And your birth name. I like to stay incognito when I'm on the streets. Welcome back, Michelle, from your glorious whirlwind trip back from where? Milwaukee. Oh, that's as Alice fancy. Cooper would say. Why were you in Milwaukee? Took the kid to see Mitski, which was fantastic, actually. And, you know, can kind of tie into this episode tonight. Now, was Mitski on this episode of The Love Boat? No, no. no. But Mr. DeFazio was. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, uh, you know, Laverne and Shirley took place in Milwaukee. They also have a statue of Fonzie there in Milwaukee, if you ever go. There's so much crossover in our lives. <laughs> yeah. It really is. It's really crazy. Hi, you guys. Welcome back. My name is Ishvan. In case you have not listened to our previous episodes, welcome aboard. You have already heard my co host, the lovely Michelle. And as you learned last episode, I was named after Michelle Lee. <laughs> All right, this episode, probably one of the weirdest love boats of all time, maybe in some ways. I got to be honest, and I didn't mean to interrupt you, but you read the, the, the guests, you're like, wow, this is going to be a great episode. But I'm going to admit it's a little lackluster. No, you know what? This is one of the things I was thinking about. Again, I put way too much thought into the love boat. Now, the reason that I like the love boat, Michelle is because of who they pick. Like, even when the storylines or whatever aren't so hot, I still like it because I do like seeing those people. I like seeing Patty Duke, Phil Foster, a.k.a. Mr. DeFazio, for anyone who is familiar with Laverne and Shirley, Ruth Gordon, Harold and Maud, correct? Correct. And she played every sassy old person role back in Always the day. Had sass. She was everywhere. Robert Hegez, or Hayes, this is Juan Epstein from Welcome Back, Hotter, another show that if you go back and you don't jump the shark on that show, it's a really funny show and a really enjoyable show to watch. Tab Hunter, who's a person whose name I heard all the time, and I knew who Tab Hunter was as a person, but I don't know what he's famous for. What's he famous for? Teen Idol, along with Patty Duke, actually, so they had two Teen Idols. Teen Idol in what, 1927? Mostly in the 60s. He was in a lot of movies. Um, Yeah, like what? He was in, oh my gosh. Yeah, exactly. No, Nobody I knows. He was not in any Stop. movies. No, he wasn't in a lot of movies. You should actually call up your mom and ask her. She would be able to tell you <laughs> everything about Tab Hunter. She has a sinus infection Hunter. right now. You I don't want to know. She Trust sounds me on terrible. That one. Mom, I hope you're getting better out there. But he, he was really popular in like the early 60s, I think. And I know that. I just don't know what he, was he in Greece? Wasn't he in Greece or something like that? Or Yeah, I think Greece too. He was a teacher. But it was never some Even John thing. Waters put him in a film. Right, but it's just like, I don't know why anybody loved him. He seemed like a perfectly pleasant guy, but whatever. We also have the lovely Maureen McCormick, who, of course, most famous for her role as Marsha Brady in The Brady Bunch, another great show, in my opinion. And then we have John Mark Robinson. John Mark Robinson, ladies and gentlemen, he played, like I saw a photo of him, Michelle, from the show that I think that you watched, Electra Woman and Dinah Girl. Oh, yes. I love that show. I was I didn't really get into that show, but that was a Sid and Marty Croft, right? Correct. All right. Now, we're going to cover him, too, today, because we were covering this era of pop culture for sure. I saw him in some sort of role where he's all dressed up like some sort of like weird futuristic superhero, at least for the 1970s. And then he produced some films later on that like were not like super blockbuster films, but he's also sort of like the Lyle Wagoner was that breed of handsome man that was around when we were kids. He was on the Carol Burnett show to play sort of the leading man. He went on to like be like a powerhouse in like trailer rentals. Star on, like, wagons. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's it. Star wagons. So like he would the, the trailers that the stars will be in, he'd rent them to everyone. So he became very successful in that. This dude, John Mark Robinson, he is like the prop like impresario of Canada. So he owns some huge prop company. Still? I think so. He's like 72 years old, 73 years old now, because I had no idea who this guy was. It's innovative when the acting gigs dry up. It's smart. It's super smart. Find another smart. way in. He bought up all that stuff. So he does that stuff. Now, um, we, we touched on Sid, Sid Croft. So before, earlier on in one of our earlier episodes, we were telling or encouraging everybody to follow Charo on Instagram. 
the person we'd like you to follow, and maybe she might even be a guest on He Does a Live chat every single Sunday is Sid Croft of Sid and Marty Croft. He is still alive. He is beyond amazing. And if you do not believe me or do not agree, I don't know. I'll fight you on the Lido deck. I don't care. Um, <laughs> yeah, he is really remarkable. And he's like in his 90s and he's sh- sharp. And he has a funny. tree house in his backyard that he climbs up on. You get nervous when he's climbing on it. Supposedly, Michelle told me he has the jewels from Land of the Lost. like in Embedded some sort- in his home. I swear to you, I want to go there so badly. He spoke to uh, Paul Rubens on one of his episodes. He speaks to a lot of different people. They'll interview one another, and you get to hear all these amazing stories from his career. He really just has so many stories and, and very remarkable. Like Mama Cass was his neighbor. I mean, he had all kinds of. But to hear him talk, he's hypnotic. He is just, he's like another kind of like not even a human. He's like this otherworldly type of a person. He's so great. So follow Sid Croft too on uh, Instagram. And Charles might be the guest. I could be wrong, but I thought that that's what he was alluding to on the last episode. Again, on Sundays, he does this live thing. Okay, so we've established the people who are on the show. Let me just read you these incredible storylines. One is called Joker is Mild, written by David Ketchum and Tony DeMarco. Then we have First Time Out, which was written by Mark Evanier and Dennis Palombo. Then we have Take My Granddaughter, Please, written by Barry Blitzer. And Michelle, you were saying that this was one of your favorite... No, this was kind of... (laughs) No, like I said, the guest stars phenomenal. They They make you like it. Like, I agree with you that, like, stuff was very weird, but... You know, like Robert Hayes is amazing and he's so fun to watch. And he's a lot of his stuff is just super like funny physical humor. He's a very good physical comedian, much Definitely. like John Ritter. And then when you add the music, even when stuff isn't going great, I think that's why this show succeeded because the people are just enjoyable to watch. And you take all these really no, I agree. charismatic I agree people. With you. That's it. That's what I was getting from this show. Now, let's also go back, Michelle. Okay. And let's make a couple of corrections because. I do believe in in the last episode, you said that Michelle Lee starred in Bye Bye Birdie. Is this correct or is this incorrect? Incorrect. I appreciate your honesty and your bravery. Was she in something else? Was she in another musical type thing? Is that what you were thinking? Or are you just... Yeah. She was in, well, she was in a lot of those movies back then. I just incorrectly identified her. And I would like to say that Stephen P. Slivka, our previous guest who we wish he was here today, he could not be here today. I mentioned his marriage to Martha Ray. That turns out to be incorrect. I, I I thought it was Martha Ray. Not correct at all. And I was saying that she was in the Polly Dent commercials, but in fact, it was Polly Grip. <laughs> and Small I just, technicality I don't there. want that going out into the world forever that I messed up what commercials she made famous. So, Michelle, what would you like to begin with on this episode? Hey, let's just start with the, the uh, Phil Foster, Mr. DeFazio one. He is a comic. He's coming on the ship. He's an old friend of Julie's father, and it's apparently owed some kind of favor because, of course, he saved his life, if I'm recalling correctly. No, I think he got him into the business. I think that's, oh, that's what, it, what was. it was. Like he hooked him up. Confusing my television show like he, plot lines. Um, he saved his life. <laughs> Many, I heard he falls in quicksand. <laughs> you know what? Here, wait, hang on. Two remarkable things on this show, too. Speaking of Mr. DeFazio, were you totally put off? and distracted and downright like disgusted by his eyebrows they are wild they're insane they're they're, now here's the thing the other thing the hair suit that's a a word right robert raises hair his afro hair Juan Epstein's hair is incredible. Like it's like it's, it's the Mars most Volta perfect hair. afro I've ever seen in my life. He's got total Mars Volta hair, and it's just incredible that it's that it has that kind of like like he's on a ship and the wind's blowing and it can't even move this thing. And then Mr. DeFazio's eyebrows probably it's the same amount of hair on his eyes. Why did people not mention anything like that? Why were they okay with that? Because it wasn't as, as back then. Like it wasn't how it is now. Everything like oh. you've got now, you got to look perfect. You have to have perfect, perfect. eyebrows. Perfect Look at some of the people's teeth on the love boat. Oh They're my downright God. gross. This is why I say like our generation is still was lucky because we've said it before. Maybe I haven't brought it up yet. And it's one of the things I also wanted to bring up is as kids, we knew people from every generation. We knew Milton Berle. We knew who Red Buttons was. We knew who all these old timers were. We were familiar with vaudeville and the Catskills. It's like... It's like we knew all this stuff that was not of our time, but it was commonplace to us that we just knew these people that, yeah, again, were not 
perfectly beautifully attractive by any stretch of the imagination. You didn't have TikTok back then. Well, this is the thing too. Like the wonderful thing about the Love Boat, they let all these people not only be on television in their older years and stuff like that. This is like the most popular show on TV. So these people got to be seen by millions of people, you know, in the era when there was only three like major networks. So that also is incredible. It's like you hear complaints constantly about no roles for women once they get past the age of like 24 or whatever, a what horrible age it is. And older people just kind of get like forgotten. And on this in this time on this show, there it, there was no shortage of bushy eyebrowed older people uh, starring in these in these plot lines. But yeah, he comes on. He's cracking corny jokes left and right. And Julie is so sweet that she's trying to give him an opportunity. You start to see the cracks in this right from the beginning. They establish that he's kind of seen his his heyday. He's like past his prime and his jokes are kind of old fashioned. And Isaac asks, what's the deal? No, it's cool. I got a friend who owes me a favor. Thank you. Listen, I got another friend who owes me some caviar. No, that's okay, Isaac. I just want Barry to feel like he's still on top. You know, when he was a star, he gave my dad his start in the business. No kidding. You know, I think I remember Barry when I was a kid. Didn't he used to appear on the Ed Sullivan show? Yeah, he was on all those shows then. And didn't he wear a crazy hat and carry a cane? He still does. And didn't he tell old jokes? He still does. (laughs) But he sure deserves more than the cheapest cabin on the ship. Thanks again. Anytime. Fast forward where uh, Mr. DeFazio is basically kind of holding the fact that he got Julie's dad into showbiz over her head to force her hand to put him in the uh, ship's act, uh, do his comedy act on the ship. And he's he really- being incredibly sneaky because the reason he's doing this is because he found out that an agent oh, that's is right. on this on this cruise. So because of that, it's a kind of an elaborate plan, and then he's using Julie. Uh, it's it's a smart plan, though. Yes, and then even to get her to feel sorry for him, he fakes a heart attack. <laughs> he's in rehearsal setting up the lights, and then all of a sudden, you don't know what's going on because he sees that she's about to tell him that he's not going to be in the act, and he can sense it. <laughs> and then he does. Pulls out the old heart attack. Can I talk to you a minute, Barry? Yeah, sure. Ronnie, take five. Barry, you know that when we book the shows for these cruises, that they're pretty well worked out in advance, right? Yeah, go ahead. Well, I don't know how to tell you this, but I... What's wrong? What is it? Let no, me no, get the doctor no, for no, you. No, 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 I'll be all right. Let me, let me catch my breath. I'll be, I'll be okay. I'll, I'll really... What is it, Barry? Your heart? No, no, no. I'll be all right. Just give us a second. Are you sure? Do you know what I really need? The sound of applause. I bet you after the show, I'll be real good. Wild horses couldn't stop me from performing. That is an incredibly dirty trick. And it shows the, the, the extremes someone might go to in trying to sustain or resurrect their career. Now, this is kind of crazy. This plot line, but I'm going to say I'm going to defend this because I think as crazy as it all is, I think these are one of the things that the show does kind of really well in that getting older is not fun. Getting older is is a really, really difficult thing. And people do get forgotten every single day. I'm getting heavy now. And the way that they did this through entertainment, that's kind of the trite element of this. But for him in that moment, these are the parts that I've talked about as far as soap opera and stuff when he he gets confronted by Julie after this because she is genuinely upset. She's being very, very kind, very sweet. And then she hears him really, truly be honest and bare his soul about what he's going through and why he would go to those extremes because... Okay, I'm a phony. But a desperate one. Why do you think I came in this cruise for? Because I knew that Freddie Stevens, the agent, was going to be on it. Back in Hollywood, he won't even let me in the office to audition. Ain't that a laugh? I was a star when he was pressing pants. Now, here's the thing. Do you recall, Michelle, when he does actually perform, right? Yes. And he's bombing. He is bombing like mad. And then he realizes it. And that was the turning point moment for him, not only in the episode, but in his career, in his life. And he goes and grabs a stool. I was just going to say that. (laughs) 
pulls up a stool. Because what so does he want to do? it's getting serious if he pulls up a stool. Did you hear the cool term he used? No. So they could it? rap? Oh, I, I, yes, I did. I was just going to say they can rap to the people about modern times. <laughs> totally rapping with people. And then he he does sort of like his more like alternative comedy routine that he just comes up with on the fly that is not any funnier than the stuff that he had done before. And I would like to give everyone an example of part of this amazing routine. And this is the, the material that gets the uh, the agent to pay attention and want to book him then after this, where he talks about the differences between names of kids when he was a kid versus the names of kids of today, right? Quote, unquote. You could do a whole comedy routine on names of people on the love boat that don't ever exist. And the names they give kids today... A lot different than it was in my day. My day had names like Tom, Dick, Harry, and Charlie, Mike. You know, today you go to park, your mother say names like uh, uh, Michael Jeffrey. <laughs> it's still Mike. <laughs> but it's, it's not two different. names, Michael Jeffrey. Oh, yeah. It's so completely crazy. And guess what? You know what is ironic, people? I did a little research. Michelle? Yes? Do you know what Mr. DeFazio's real name is in real life? Bill Foster. No. His real name. Oh, that's like a that, stage that's a name. stage name? His real name is Fivel. Bill Fievel? No, it's Fievel. Fievel, Fievel Foster? No. What? Bill Fievel. Did you, when you went to Milwaukee, is it how you checked into your room under the name of Phil Fievel? No. No, Fievel is his real first name. I can't remember what his last name is, but... What's, so now, the, what's the origin of that name? I have no idea. I didn't name him. I don't know. Fievel Again, is his name. more content for your comedy routine on <laughs> names. No, no one's going to go to that show. Hang on. But that's the thing is like this comedy routine that stinks and is saying that names are, are different, even though they're exactly the same, which makes no sense. He is the living example of a person who had a name back in whatever year he was born, 1924 or whatever, where their names weren't like Mike and John and whatever. It was Fievel. His name was Fievel. So that's weird. So, Michelle, I already mentioned that John Mark Robinson, you know, a character actor, he is, you know, like he did a sort of career path like Lyle Wagoner. And on this ship, we have someone, in my opinion, who is in the Lyle Wagoner category of handsome tall men. And that would be Tab Hunter. It is. He's very, he's, he's hunky. <laughs> he's a handsome man. He does something on the ship or they do something on the ship that does happen and why the ship is magical and they just bump into each other after a long time they had a past with one another right yeah, you run into your old high school boyfriend or whatever he was just so happens to be swimming right by you in the pool sorry ah. surely dave dave king oh what a how are you i haven't seen you since the reunion well, what's it what's it been five years just about i hear you got married also uh we're divorced. Oh. See, how about you? You uh, still single? Yeah, still single. That's great. Uh, not according to my grandmother. <laughs> oh, Graham? Graham, come here. I want you to meet somebody. Oh. And you remember my grandmother. Oh, what a wonderful character. <laughs> yeah, well, she has as mellows with age. And then the sassy gypsy woman, um, Grandma, she is like trying to like match make for her like she wants her to get married she's still not married after all of this time and then she uh she sees this tab fellow and then she asks what he does he says that he is a teacher and she gets very excited asking what university he teaches at she finds out what does he do math teacher yeah sixth grade sixth grade math teacher and then she becomes very uh, disappointed because that's not a, a high profile enough of a job for her granddaughter and she starts to talk her out of it well the whole plot line is she's trying to talk her out of reconnecting with this guy but it's clearly a love match they're falling back in love again or whatever and then grandma sets her sights on doc what was the part about the car stereo and a new car and a tape deck? Do you recall that part at all? She goes into Doc's office because she's looking for drugs because she can't sleep. Can I just sidestep uh, for a second? No, no. Yeah, she can't sleep. In like the six episodes we've watched, how many how many sleeping aids has he prescribed to people on That's the ship or to calm them down? Very free flowing with the sleeping pills in the seventies. Yeah, why not? No, you know it's like you're on like. Was international waters, so you probably well, could do whatever you want. I could see him prescribing you, like, for seasickness. 
which Charo got in that one episode. Why are you criticizing Dr. I'm not, Adam I'm Bricker? just pointing out how easy it was to get sleeping drugs back yeah, that's then. that's right. It was a good time. It was a great time. And it's like you could sleep all night long if you wanted to. But she goes on there and she was trying to basically prostitute her granddaughter out. And she's like, she's got a tape deck. Like that was some big incentive for him to like fall in love with her. And she had a new car. Was it a new car? Yes. Was that it? Yeah. So she was basically trying to like sweeten the pot. So like Dr. Adam Bricker would take an interest in her granddaughter and marry her. He was hesitant at first, though, because he didn't know what she looked like. But then, of course, once he <laughs> saw what she looked like. There was some funny stuff in that, though, because was. He, he was trying to blow Tab Hunter out of there and like. He was very funny during that. Yeah, Those are really funny things. That That's the part of the show that's really good because it was like a smaller part of it. And it was really very funny the way that he was trying to just get rid of him because he was now all of a sudden interested in her. But they don't really establish it very well, like that she's falling for the tab hunter guy. Like she is really actually liking him. And the grandmother doesn't want that to happen. No, because he's just a math teacher of sixth graders. Yeah. But then this is the thing. Doc is great. Doc is fantastic. Doc can not only fix you like physically, he can help fix relationships. And he does so in the tradition of what also that we were always inundated with as children. Foster Brooks. <laughs> Do you remember Foster Brooks? Yeah, I remember. And he did like his most accurate impression of Foster Brooks to you know show the grandmother that he was not the man for her granddaughter. And he did an incredible job. <laughs> So set him off, Joe. I got a lot of other stories you all know. Oh, oh! <laughs> All ready to operate, nurse. You're <laughs> going to be a uniform. What? Hands off of her. What's all right, Grandma? Almost engaged. Oh, <laughs> my dead body. Leave her alone, you degenerate. <laughs> Oh, how did I ever get into this? I am a stupid old meddling fool. That's right. <laughs> You're also a wonderful person, and I love you very much. Doc was just putting on an act for you because I didn't have the guts to tell you I'm in love with Dave. Michelle and Mike. Yes. Named after Michelle Lee. What? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> what did you make of what is her name? Ruth Bader Ginsburg. What's Ruth the Gordon? Ruth Gordon. Her outfits. They were good. They were you know typical like hip older woman outfits. But I did like her hat that she had on at the very end after everything was nicely wrapped up and. I don't remember that. Patty do got to get her choice in men and end up with Tab Hunter. Yes, it was very nice. And I think on this episode, there's a lot of sweet things that happen on the love boat. And she, much like the Mr. DeFazio character, they were kind of uh, difficult and, and doing something kind of wrong earlier. But it shows that they really just had good intentions, really, ultimately. And she really just wanted her granddaughter to be happy. So it was kind of a nice ending. Yeah. She almost became like a matchmaker because then she was trying to set somebody up with Doc. <laughs> well, she had her other granddaughter. It was pretty funny. There's funny jokes slammed in the end. And she is very good. She always plays the same kind of character, I think, that woman. But she always does it so great. It's like Fred Willard or something. Like when you saw Fred Willard, he's playing the same character, but you never got tired of that character. Now, were you shocked at all by... Maureen McCormick's behavior. Well, she was pretty uh, forward with, I always keep wanting to say Juan Epstein. <laughs> I know, we're sorry, you guys, but <laughs> we know people based on their sitcom shows. Uh, Juan Epstein is how we will know him forever. We apologize. Um, but yeah, I mean, she was really forward thinking. Her whole, her whole character was odd to me because she was a college age student, but they never said if she was with anybody on the boat friends family she would just always appeared by herself i i had a theory though that like she's really like a very liberated woman very modern woman but she was also a cunning woman in that she went onto this cruise looking just for a physical Could encounter be. now check it out listen all right so the thing is my theory she was a liberated woman she was looking 
for some sort of hookup on this ship. That was her specific intention. This is my theory. And then she sees that this Juan Epstein guy is a virgin, right? right? So that's why she targeted him, because then she wouldn't later have to go to Doc to get any medication for syphilis or anything like that, because <laughs> he has never had sex before. It's a long theory, but I, you could be right. Maybe that's it. And instead of like some creepy guy who's some sort of predator on the ship, they switched it around. And she's not creepy, but she's just she's making a very intelligent choice on the ship. He seemed like a sweet guy. And then she would avoid any kind of like, you know, lingering problem after the cruise came to an end. That's that's my theory. That's my my uh, whatever C story of this. But <laughs> it was really weird because she's really pursuing him. And you know what the storyline kind of reminded me of? What, what? Do you remember the movie Little Darlings when we were kids? You know, I do, but not as as clearly as you do. It it was literally because the same thing, because when he is talking with the friend or whatever, and then they all talk like, oh, did you have sex or whatever? They did end up getting together, he and Maureen McCormick. But he tells them that they didn't, which is basically the same plot line of Christy McNichol's plot line in Little Darlings. Spoiler alert, sorry, I should have said that, but similar. But Little Darlings was pretty heavy, wasn't it, though? It was really heavy. heavy. That's For what I remember. teenagers, it was a really heavy movie. I liked Lighthearted Fair, and I think I started watching that because I liked the people, but it was a little too serious for me. it had all great for kids me. in it. Yeah, for Matt sure. Matt Dillon, Tatum O'Neill. Like I said, I had a crush on Tatum O'Neill. I thought she was so cute. And, oh, uh, and that French actor. I can't think of his name now. It's, he was uh, Alessandro or whatever. Yeah, that guy. Amand Alessandro, yes. whatever the dude's name was. I remember that guy. That's right. Oh, but does he, he, he's with one of those young girls then in that? Well, no, she's pursuing him, oh. Tatum O'Neill. But that's the whole thing. She li- One lies that didn't do anything, and then one tells... Oh, yeah, yeah. And then they both lie, but for different reasons. I don't know. Let's just shift to Over the Edge. Let's really just... If we're going <laughs> to go back to a Matt Dillon vehicle... change the podcast to 70s teen movies. Or we're sorry. We're, we're bouncing all <laughs> over the place, people. Yeah, I don't know. This was crazy, but like again, I think it's the people who are on it that really sell it and make you want to oh, watch it. I agree. It is a great cast of people on the, on this episode. You Marie McCormick is that. so cute, and like that older woman, she does do a great job in that role. What is Patty Duke famous for? Oh, they're cousins. But you told Identical me too, like cousins. Okay, I remember that, but I never watched it. She you told married me that, John Aston. She told me this. Is what Michelle told me, I didn't know this, and this is who was on the first. We have already mentioned that on the first episode of season two, where Gomez Adams, that's who she was married to, right? Correct. I had no idea, And their guys. son None. is um, Samwise Gandhi. I had no idea about that either. Seriously, I had no... And I think that Michelle's tricking me, but she never... Michelle's very truthful. And I'm not she's sure like, it's his birth son or if he adopted him, if she's from another marriage. Exactly. I'd have to look that it's up. It's insane. And call me. But, um, yeah. She, there's also a really... I can't... The title escapes me. There is a, like one of those late night Channel 7 movies that used to be on when we were younger where she drops acid. What? <laughs> she was... What are you talking about? Patty Duke was very famous. Who's the person who had tigers in their house? That's... Um, uh, Janet... Not Janet Lee. Um, Doris Day? No. It's... Why is this cat walking all over the place? Who's this guy think he is? He's making this very difficult. No, you know, the woman, like, what's her name? She was married to Don Johnson, the young actress. and Her she, mother was the one that had the tiger. That's why I always get mixed up with all of these people. She was a famous actress, but she had, like, literal... Actually, she, I think, is the one I, mis- I mixed up with Michelle Lee. Oh, man, we're confused, man. <laughs> we're Have you been at, taking Ginkgo? I told way, you to take Ginkgo Biloba because it's like it helps. Yeah, I know, but it's like, come on, this is more fun. All right, we fixed up our things Follow Sid Croft on Instagram. I swear to you, it's it's fantastic. If anyone knows where you can get the jewels and the crystals from Land of the Lost that they used to find in the Slee Stack Caves, contact me because you know I don't know what my limit is as far as how much I would pay for that, but I would desperately like to have some of that. Anything else, Michelle? No, I think we covered quite a lot of thing, different things on this episode. Oh, could could. Cat's feisty. <laughs> Look at that guy just looking, he's latched on to you. He's trying to play he with crazy He's too. feisty right Julie, now. He's a crazy man. Thanks, you guys, for listening to this episode. Like we said, we had our friend Stephen P. Slipka, who will be returning at some point. We had our daughter Evie, and I think she wants to bring one of her friends on, which would be really fun to see again with what two uh, uh, younger people, their perception of one of these episodes. Yeah, I we- would. 
definitely have a bunch of people that want to be on this. So yeah, for sure. We, we have a, a few other guests lined up. And again, we are going to try once we get it together to be able to do a more remote type of a thing. I actually asked someone that I didn't even tell you today that it may happen. But thank you guys for being with us. Uh, make sure to return in the next two weeks once you've recovered uh, for the next episode, episode seven, season one. And until then, I am Ishvan. I'm Michelle. Captain Stubing, Captain Stubing, please come to the bridge. And we're, we're loving, loving the, the love, love boat. boat. See you next time. Michael Jeffrey. Hi, guys. It's me, Ishvan, host of Love in the Love Boat. And before you go, I wanted to invite you to check out my other show, Ishvan's Imaginary Podcast. Yes, it is a kids and family show, but I think it's a show anyone can enjoy. Here, take a peek. Oh, well, Ishvan, in my college days and listeners, I was very active in musical theater. And I was somewhat celebrated in my portrayal of Adam Pontepe from Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, the role made famous by Mr. Howard Keel. And as a matter of fact, I have been told my voice resembles and even rivals his. Here, take a listen. Bless your beautiful heart, wherever you may be. We didn't meet the bottom wheel in the bed that you look out for me. See? Dad, that's so embarrassing. I don't understand. Do you hear his voice? He has like a Jim Neighbors quality where it goes into something completely different. It's kind of shocking. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I've ever heard you sing. That is very unlike your voice. Wow. Colorful characters, award-winning music, and humor and content in a capital G-rated glory that can take on any other podcast out there. So whether it's with your kids, nieces and nephews, grandchildren, or just you and your inner child, Ishvan's Imaginary Podcast is available everywhere podcasts are found to make you all smile and sing along. Check it out today.